What's up, brand builder? Stephen Horahan here on the Brand Master Podcast. And in this episode, I'm joined by Ariadna Navarro, Chief Growth Officer at VSA Partners, a brand strategy design agency in New York. Now, Ariadna is a strategist with her finger on the pulse. And in today's episode, we dive into the wild world of Web3 and how big and small brands can make the transition. Specifically, we cover where brands fit within Web3, including NFTs, crypto, and meta. What does real world application look like in Web3? And how do you approach the conversation of Web3 with clients? We also discuss the emergence of ChatGPT, its impact on branding, and where the future of branding is headed. So if you want to learn how to prepare for the future from a branding expert with a passion for future-proofing brands, then don't miss this episode of the Brand Master Podcast. Now, before we dive into the episode, I want to take a second to show some appreciation. I appreciate every single one of our listeners, but I have a soft spot for listeners who share the love. A shout out to Yoli1991 from the United States. Love the podcast, classes, group, amazing. I love how Stephen puts everything into perspective and how he has organized everything in the Brand Master Academy. It has truly helped me to become an amazing brand strategist, according to my clients. If you want to share the love and possibly get a shout out on the podcast, please take a couple of minutes to leave a review on your favorite platform. Welcome to the Brand Master Podcast, a show specialized in helping branding professionals and entrepreneurs to build brands using strategy, psychology, and creative thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Master Podcast. And I'm absolutely delighted to have on the show with me today, Ms. Ariadna Navarro from VSA Partners. She's the Chief Growth Officer there. And we're going to get stuck into something pretty interesting, uh, uh, a topic that I know a lot of you are very interested in at the moment, and that is Web3. But before we do, Ariadna, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to have this chat. Now, Web3 is still relatively new. I know that it's been around for, for a few years now, but it's it's kind of an enigma to a lot of people. But before we get stuck into that, I, I'd like to kind of step back a little bit. Now, you're the chief growth officer at VSA Partners there in New York. Now, can you give us a bit of a background as to you know the 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 background you've come from and how you ended up where you've ended up yeah for sure uh i well first of all i'm from venezuela so i'm a i'm a latin woman in new york and mm -hmm. i've been here for the majority of my career i started my career in advertising at leah burnett in in caracas and i came to new york on a summer holiday to visit a friend of mine and she's like oh i have a headhunter you should meet and i was like well what what's a headhunter <laughs> and fast forward to i interviewed at a company here called wonderman which is a digital uh agency and direct response and then i went home and forgot about it and literally two weeks later i had i get a call i had a job offer and i said yes on the phone that's how young and naive I was. I'm like, of course, that sounds like a great offer. I, lo of I, I love when, that. I love when that. When I got here with a duffel bag, I'm like, wait, I don't think that's enough to live on. <laughs> what was I thinking? So my career sort of started here um, after a few years at Leo. And then I went into consulting very quickly after that. So I spent a few years at Wonder Men. I did the dot com, of course, because if you didn't back then, you're an idiot. Of course, hoping I was going to become a gazillionaire. I am here today, so that's proof that I did not. I mean, not because I wouldn't be on a show, but I would probably be on a yacht in the south of France. Uh, I've, uh, had I've had gazillionaires on the show. That's so true. It's all right. So I take that back. I would still be here, but from my yacht. Is that good? Is that better? Beautiful. That's, Beautiful. A better, that's, a better, that's a better answer. Fair enough. Um, and then I went into consulting, but on the innovation side. So I spent really the bulk of my career, we're sort of really thinking about how do companies grow if your market or your audience is shrinking or if, you know, there's technologies that are disrupting your business, how do you adapt? What is the pipeline you have to develop? How do you think of new business model innovation? So really trying to actually, I kind of, for a very long time, I lived 10 years in the future because when you work in innovation, you really think you kind of have to play God a little bit, which is mm. maybe a blasphemy for some, but you have to try to really look at the patterns and think about, okay, what's going to happen seven, 10 years from now? And then how do I help Kellogg's or Pepsi or Ford or whomever? How do I help them 
help them think about where to go next and what moves to make. So it was really exciting, honestly, and I and I loved it. And then I sort of naturally steered into a brand job, and I ended up um, at Interbrand as chief strategy officer. And Interbrand is one of the largest brand consultancies mm-hmm. in the world, and they're mm-hmm. phenomenal. And they really look at brand as a business asset. So how do you look at brand? It's just an expression of your business strategy. And then by default, the brand has a business value, which mm-hmm. I kind of love because it was sort of these all 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 the sides of the of my career sort of coming together into one job. And I love that place and everyone there still were good friends. And then I went to the estate partners as chief strategy officer. Um, and then now recently took on this growth officer role, which looks to do kind of what I've done my whole life is like, how do we grow? And what are the capabilities that we should be looking at? And what are the teams and the skill sets that you need to be considering and thinking about in order to fulfill kind of the promises of you know clients today what they need but again sort of thinking of the future so that's kind of like what leads me to my i'm not going to say obsession because it's going to sound weird but my passion <laughs> my passion for for new technologies uh and and what we can do with them ethically Lovely, lovely. Uh, That's a very uh, long answer. I, I, no, I, <laughs> stop I, me. Stop. I, me I, I love. Ha- I love how it start, started <laughs> off with that that bold, fresh youthfulness of just saying with a duffel bag. Yeah, just let <laughs> let let's go. I love that. It's it it it, it kind of reminds you of a time where you, you just you know you had no worries and you just see you just said yeah let's go. I, I absolutely lo- love that. And and you're perfectly positioned to answer some questions that I have at the moment because with the way things are changing thinking into the future is something that we're all going to have to do very very quickly but before we get there I know that there are a lot of people who have an interest in web3 and specifically our role within the world of web3 as brands but you know explain to me from your perspective as if I'm a new client coming into the room and I don't know what Web3 is. What is Web3? That's a very good question. And I, I will explain it the way that I explain it to myself because mm-hmm. it's still work in progress. And it's there's actually various uh, definitions of it. So the way I think of it is like this. And my mom was a historian, so she always told me, you have to understand the past to understand the future. So I think of it like this. Web one mm-hmm. was static web. And sorry, let me back. I'm going to back up one second. The web is not the internet, but the, the, but actually a group of protocols and tools to interact with the internet. Mm-hmm. So that's premise number one, basic premise. Because you think of like web, and you're like, oh, is that is that my browser? Well, no, no, no. it's a, it's it's a, a toolkit of protocols and ways to interact. So web one is you know for the olden folk, if there are any olden folk to listen. It's that sort of static web. You had banners, you know, like data was stored on website on website servers. Like if you remember, it was like the Netscape of the world. The Netscape Mm -hmm. of the world. Web two was which is where we're at today, obviously, since web three is the future, is that user generated interactive web. Mm -hmm. And when it started, it was like, you know, blogs started coming in, you were able to leave a comment in a chat. And that's the, the era of the Facebook, the Airbnb, Twitter. It's, it, it allows for interaction. Now, the key thing here is that, d- that the data is owned by the companies. So when mm-hmm. you interact today, the data is owned by Google, or the, data, the data is owned by Facebook, or it's owned by a brand, or again, by Facebook, because you use your Facebook login to get into everything and to interact with everything. Mm-hmm. Web3 comes along to try to solve for data protection, privacy, and ownership of that data. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the, the impetus. So the, the easiest way that I, that I think of Web3 is still sort of that interactive web, but it's decentralized. Mm-hmm. And it's it's encrypted in a way that your data is protected because it is powered by AI and blockchain. Well, and mm-hmm. AI is a debate because people are saying it's going to play a big role, but blockchain is sort of the main kind of platform or one of them that powers uh, Web3. Mm-hmm. So that's how I think about it. Again, like the, the main thing, if you have to take one thing away, is the main thing is like Web3 is decentralized. 
And the most essential thing is who controls the data and the content. Mm -hmm. So it, it, to, to, to kind of distill that down a little bit, uh, we could say that Web1 was kind of like monologue. So, uh, you know, those who are on the internet broadcasting their message without the ability for us to respond. Web2 is more dialogue, where there's a two-way conversation, but we have to go to their world or their address, let's say. And they, in own, order, they own it, your and they own, that conversation. They own yep. that conversation. Yep. And Web3 now is a breakaway from us having to go to their uh address for us have uh, to 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 go and, and kind of give their uh, our our data or allow them to own the conversation web3 is a world where it's decentralized and we own our stuff so it, it, will that be a good way to to distill that's it? a perfect way yeah i mean think of it, the, the thing that's fascinating it's like if you went on a website and this is the control part because the control part is was the thing that was the hardest for me to understand and it still is because it's a concept Mm. It's like, oh, okay, so the files live on multiple servers and multiple computers, but then because it's blockchain, only you can access the file. Like, I mean, it's it's really weird. Mm -hmm. It's a really weird concept. It's like saying mm -hmm. there's a shirt in someone else's house, but then you own the shirt, but then you go into the house and grab the shirt. I mean, it's bizarre, right? It's really weird. It's a really mm -hmm. weird concept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you think of Web2, you're making, you're buying a shirt on a website. You're making a payment. Mm -hmm. That payment has to go through a bank. That website has a set of rules. You have to abide by those set of rules. Those set of rules are created by that website, but they're also governments that create, you know, a set of policy and and rules of you know, trade and and payment and payment transparency. And so there's all these layers of rules mm. that you that that you, that are that you have to abide by or that govern that interaction. Mm -hmm. Web3 doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. So that's when the big debate and the ethical debate comes in because it could be used for very bad things, mm. as you can imagine. And it could be hopefully done responsibly and ethically. Yeah, so I suppose then if we, if we and I like to, to, to use metaphors and analogies where, where, where I, I can because it, it simplifies my own understanding of it, um, I suppose then, you know, when we do go to somebody's address to have a conversation, not only do, do they own the conversation, but there are other entities standing there watching the conversation to make sure that it's in line with, with their protocols. So, Correct. you know, all of that data is, is not only are we putting it out there? It doesn't belong to us. And there are many different entities with their hands on it. And this decentralization kind of puts a bit of a bubble around ourselves and our privacy and our information so that, you know, we can, we don't have to go to their address. We don't have to have, uh, you know, these, uh, these other people listening in on these, these conversations and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of taking a bit more control back and a bit more ownership of our own data back. Is that right? Yeah, correct. And and crypto is the best proof point of that. So mm -hmm. you can I mean we all know where crypto where crypto went and we're going through this crypto winter and I think it'll come back, but we have yet to see. The the good side of crypto, the problem is that's not where it lives today. But the good side of crypto is because you're you're decentralizing and you're eliminating the supervisor, you know, mm. if you will, and the supervisor, let's say the bank. Mm -hmm. Um you can have literally someone in you can have someone in venezuela where i'm from you know you can have a a an indian in the amazon jungle who weaves baskets mm -hmm. and they can they can sell that basket well they would have to get to a post office but assuming that they can get to a post office to send you the basket they can send that basket and you can pay them in crypto without them needing a bank account mm -hmm. which they don't have in the middle of the amazon jungle so mm -hmm. It, it, it does create this extraordinary uh, world of possibilities. The mm. challenge and the problem is, is that right now it hasn't been used for that as much. It's been used as a as a an investment uh, or a betting tool. And here's where we're at with mm. crypto. Yeah. So so uh, uh, so really, 
if you think about it back in the day um you know if if you and i were neighbors and you had a, a skill set of you know creating pottery and i had a skill set for farming i could go and farm your garden and you could give me you could pay me in in pottery because there is no other uh you know overseer of that relationship and of that transaction and that kind of disappeared in the world of web 2 because you had all of these different layers and now with this decentralization we're kind of able to take a bit of control back and we're able to barter a bit more and trade a bit more and and you know determine our our you know our own rate and 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 the way we do things a little bit more than we could in in web 2 um and, and that's kind of the 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 and and again this is an evolving thing and even though i've been um I, i've kind of been in and around the the world of web 3 for 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 a little while now you know i'm 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 still kind of evolving my own thoughts on 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 really categorical because i like to in order for me to understand things i need to visualize them and put them in a very specific place in my mind and and really like particles it's still settling for me to have that that clarity and i think that's that's an evolving thing and and you know it over time that will be become a lot more clear in terms of brands and and the world of branding where do brands fit into this world of web3 and where do the opportunities lie obviously there are different facets to this the the likes of nfts crypto meta where do where do brands have the opportunity to to embrace web3 yeah and you just hit on the the top 3 things we know now so there's the back end of of this web3 world and then there's the front end you know the back end is ai or the, again this is how i how i comprehend it so i'm not a developer or an engineer but it's the easiest way that i can explain it to clients so you've got blockchain and and ai will people believe will power with 3 because of the machine to machine conversation and then the front end of that is the three things that you just said the mm -hmm. crypto or the things that we know today there may be more coming nfts crypto and 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 meta so when when i think of brands and the conversations we have and you know very often we're doing a campaign for someone and we think about like oh should we do an nft and what should that do and what is the role of that nft and i i look at metaverse in particular and nfts in particular as another channel and some people may not like this because i think you know the entire world should be digital but i do i think of it as another channel and by that i mean another way to engage with the brand and what is a brand's dream and desire to prolong that engagement mm -hmm. the longer you interact with the brand the more in love you're going to be the more in love you're going to be the more you're going to buy or the more you can use or the more you're going to recommend to a friend that social mm -hmm. capital has a financial value so if you can create more opportunities to engage with a the brand then you're going to increase brand value and business value so when you look at something like an nft you start to think about okay what role does it play okay when we say nft nfts are it's just a concept you know it's just tokenizing a digital experience so that you can use it to do something nft could be a thing right it could be michael jordan i don't know whatever basket and whatever game and you make it an nft and you buy that for a gazillion dollars and and then i don't know you show it to some friends because <laughs> some of these nfts you're like well what do, what do i do with the the cat you know the famous cat that's right all it could be a token to an experience mm -hmm. so you are uh going to an nfl game and that gives you access to backstage and you can actually have this whole backstage experience and you know so the nft it's it's a virtual element in a in an analog experience because that's mm -hmm. when you know things start to get sort of interesting so you use that to go in somewhere you can have a proper and you know collectible so you could go to board ape if you have half a million dollars and buy your little board ape and and then you have access to that community it's a virtual community that's really the metaverse so when you think of a brand and this is truly my obsession when you think of the brand and the conversations we have what i tell clients is what are you going to create that's meaningful how are you creating value 
Because what I worry about, and I think I always have, but it's been crystallized with Book 3, is how do we create these worlds where people are just getting lost and not living the real world and sort of real life and having real experiences? And are we going to end up in a world where we do just live in a digital world and that's it? And we don't have mm. any human interaction. So I, I want brands to think about what is the what is the value that you are creating if you want to create this full experience that has you know 18 collectible tokens and uh, you know requires an hour a day of, a, of an immersive experience and you're starting to create a little metaverse it's like well do you want people to spend three and a half hours a day in nike world mm. i mean as a brand you should ask yourself that and what is your moral imperative and and, and what is your moral responsibility to that person. So mm. I'm not sure a lot of brands, certainly not gaming companies are asking themselves that because the, their goal is the opposite. Their goal is to have you spend half of your life playing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think it's a powerful tool. I think you just have to think about how to use it in a way that's creating mm. some value. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, it is still, um, it, it, it's very difficult to conceptualize what the the digital and the analog world look like merging together because of course you know if you create your meta and you invite your your customers into your world to 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 live in a digital environment for the sole purpose of you know monopolizing their engagement or or monopolizing their their attention then of, of course there's there's an ethical question there when it comes to to digital brands especially gaming brands you know of course they from 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 the the 80s they've been creating products to 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 keep people attached to the screen and and that's not going to change anytime soon so you know when it comes to you know real world application let's say for let's say for a, a, a normal business let's say uh, you know we're not talking uh, in nikes and, and and apples here let's let's say you know a, a, a million dollar business who that that wants to embrace the world of of web3 yeah what does real world application of web3 for a brand of that size look like yeah and it, it it's a great question because you're right. The big brands have money and they're pouring, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into this. Um, a friend of mine was telling me the other day, she had bought a bracelet from a friend of hers. Sorry, it was the other way around. No, she had bought a, she was a jewelry maker. And so she has a small brand. I think it's like a $3 million brand. And she bought a bracelet, which is not inexpensive, but her, uh, I don't know if her partner, I think, is an artist. So with the bracelet, you got a, an NFT of a painting uh, of her of her partner. So in her in my friend's mind, all of a sudden, this three thousand dollar bracelet seemed like a bargain because she's like, "Oh, I'm getting this beautiful gold bracelet with a little diamond, and I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a, a piece of art." So again, like this is this is a perfect example of adding value. Like when you think about you know, how do you use NFTs? It's like, how do you enhance that experience? You know, do you want to bring, in her case, it was like, it's all about her the creativity. That's what the brand stands for. Like you have to look at NFTs, like no other, the same way you would look at any brand execution. What is your brand strategy? So mm. take Coca-Cola. They're all about happiness. Okay, then how do you use that digital experience to drive happiness? And if you can do it in a way that it tells sort of this consistent story, then it works, then it's fine, then it makes total sense. So mm. same exact thing for a small company. I mean, for small companies, it's even, you know, a bigger world of possibilities because most of the stuff is built on open source. So they could hire a developer and create something quite easily, quite quickly. So, and then you can put it on, you know, you can put it on, um, on any of the NFT marketplaces, if even if you want. So anyone can really start to think about how do you enhance that experience? And how do you create a moment, what we call a moment where you opt in? In the past, it used to be like, oh, well, to create this moment, you know, let's not create moments where you opt out. Now there's so much out there. 
that you actually have to create moments to opt in. That means exactly that. It means you stop what you're doing so that you actually pay attention. Mm. So when you're a small company and you think of it that way, think of like, okay, what is the value I can add? You know, if I am a hand cream company and I only sell hand creams and I don't have a lot of dollars, like what would my customers need? And can I solve that through that digital experience? Mm. So if you uh, start to think of it that way, it's just a brilliant add on to any small company. I, I want I want to, to go back to your friend who bought the bracelet. Now, she said that the bracelet, even though it was inexpensive, seemed like a bargain because she was getting this painting of her husband. Where did she how did she come up with 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 the valuation of that NFT to her? And what does that NFT look like in the real world? for her will she get a, a a printout of the of that and put it up in in her home where does she see the value of that nft ah well that's the question of all nfts because they live here yes or you know when it's art because by the way art is only one application of nfts right mm -hmm. so nfts are a gazillion different things but when when it becomes a digital asset, it lives on your phone. It lives on a TV. I mean, in her case, she literally has the painting on on her as a screensaver at home. She gets a print, so she does have it printed as well. So mm. that's that analog digital overlap that's going to have to happen. I mean, wh whoever you know, the person who bought Madonna's NFT. I don't know if you saw it when it came out last year. Yeah, I had to watch it like this because it was <laughs> it was very Madonna. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I think this is probably a PG, uh, a PG podcast. I, th um, I, th I think we I could use that. Like, I, I think we could use that phrase to explain a lot of things. It's very Madonna. <laughs> we, we'll all get it. Yeah, it was, it was perfect. It was very, very on brand. I, all I could think is like, where does? What do you do with that? Like, is mm. that a screensaver in your home, and or are you walking around with your phone showing people? But that is what. You know nfts like especially when it's entertainment that's what they do mm. when they're a token to use to you know towards something else or a collectible or uh then it's different because you it has a function mm. the, the way i understand the way the way i've been it, the way it's been easiest for uh, for me to understand nfts is by looking at them as kind of social currency and uh, i i don't know who it was maybe it was gary v or, or, or someone like that because i know that that he speaks a lot about it um you know in, in the way that you know you 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 show off your your kicks or the way you show off your 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 mercedes you know that's social currency to the world to say hey you know this is my status this is this is the, the you know this is the 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 space i play in do you yeah do you kind of it, it do you see see nfts in in the same way i think it's changed a little bit mm. because of the crypto fallout and you need it you need crypto to buy nfts so i think it's changed a little bit since gary probably said that last year i imagine or two years ago it was that like i remember you know i was obsessed with board eight board ape yacht club from the early days and it did give me a little bit of like oh you know i'm talking about something someone doesn't know and then when i went down my crypto madness rabbit hole alice in wonderland crazy time which that, i'm not going to share no we, we can but that might be for another podcast <laughs> i remember going like i was so obsessed and i would go to dinner parties and talk about it and then after like an hour i would realize like oh that person is not interested in what i'm saying you know like do you use dex tools and they would look at me like what is wrong with you woman and no i don't want to talk to you like oh can i switch seats you know that was my, the cue that i was but, but I felt that I had the key to something mm. many people didn't. And that's still the case because most people don't own NFTs. And it's an experiment that's been up and down. You know, when you look at like Decentraland, which is like the most known kind of little meta world, it's like, it only has like 50,000 people left now. And NFTs, you know, it, it takes a shite load of energy to, you know, to burn crypto so it's like the 
the blockchain that Bitcoin is on takes the energy of Finland or the equivalent of the energy used in Finland. I mean, it's banana. So there's, again, like, it's hard to talk about it at one angle without really seeing the whole picture. Mm. Mm. So that social currency, I think, has been dampened a little bit by un the understanding of, you know, the energy usage, the ways it's been used for not so good. So mm. I believe in it still. It just has, it's like a, it's a cycle of innovation. It has to come around. Well, look, I mean, you... You work w w for for a branding agency, and and that's what you talk to businesses about. You talk to them about their their brand. When you sit down, whether it's in a a, a discovery or a workshop, when you sit down with a client, how uh, uh, now a, a client mm -hmm. who is not up on Web three, but who is relatively uh, to, relatively progressive and and want you know, what's best for their brand, whatever direction that may be. Let's say, let's just say they're open. Mm -hmm. How do you raise the the topic of Web3 and uh, put the opportunity in front of them? What does that conversation look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So it's usually in the context of the business conversation. So we're not a Web3 only agency, meaning like there are agencies that this is all they do. They're either developers or or their marketplaces, or so that's all they talk about. Our conversations with clients are in the context of business and brand. So if we're having a conversation, or when we're having a conversation about a business challenge, let's let's say it's an internal business challenge. Let's say it's a company saying, I have disengaged employees, I launched a new brand, and it lives out in the world, but my employees are not really understanding what we want to do. So the brand's not really moving forward because you need to do employees. So when you think of that, you're like, okay, well, your business problem is understanding and engagement. Then you start to think about, okay, how do you solve it? And then mm -hmm. you think about, oh, here's my here's my uh, experience strategy, or here's my business strategy, or here's my communication strategy, here's my behavior change strategy. Then, okay, cool. Then you have the strategy. Then it's like, okay, then how do you execute? Mm -hmm. So when you then talk about execution, that's when you start to have these conversations of like, oh, cool. So if you have disengaged employees, like, what if we created a badge system that would be NFTs so that they could start to collect? And it's like every time they get a shout out, uh, then they get an NFT. And then after you get five NFTs, you can get a bonus or if you, you know, so you can create all these kinds of incentive programs. Mm. Uh, because again, like, don't just think of NFTs as a digital picture of something that you carry on your phone. Mm. So then you, w when you use it contextually, it's a much easier conversation with clients because then it's a no brainer when, it, if it's just like, Hey, let's invest in web three and let's just do, let's go do some metaverse <laughs> stuff. It just, it doesn't mean anything and it, mm. it's not serving a real value. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I like that. I that idea of um, uh, you know I involving the 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 employees from from an employer brand point of view to really kind of generate that culture and and to 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 get them involved in the 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 brand itself and to to really embrace the brand. And look, I, I think this is just an ever evolving thing that that we need to keep the finger on the on the pulse and with everything moving as fast as it is it's it's pretty difficult to do that now you said something to me earlier that i thought was very interesting especially with where we are now in that you always live in the future and you know th this is just a kind of a although we're talking web3 we're we're you know we're all in talking about web3 we're talking about the future and what's coming and in the last few months, we've seen, um, you know, a, a pretty, I, I would say, sobering reality of where we are with uh, with AI through ChatGPT. What have you seen with ChatGPT, and what kind of someone who who thinks in ten years' time, where do you see this going in terms of the disruption it's about to to cause? just in general first but then specifically in the branding world yeah i i mean i i am an adopter in general of new technologies i'm a nerd so i i tend to have an open mind versus shutting it down because it is 
really, really scary. And as mm. someone who values intellectual uh, nourishment, and I look at chat BT and I look at students, you know, not having to study or write essays ever again or think, it really scares me. Mm. But I think if we, if, if the good ones don't embrace it first mm. and start to use it in ways that are constructive and, and helpful, then the bad ones will. You know, mm -hmm. and then once the bad habits get good. So you can't shut, close your eyes and say, like, oh my God, I can't, you know, I'm going to shut this down and I can't allow it. And, you know, if you're at college and I've seen many universities already starting to change kind of their tune, you know, they, the first reaction was let's ban it because mm. they were realizing that, you know, wow, I have three essays that look the same. Well, guess what? They were all written by machine. So, they banned it and now they're like, well, actually, you know what? Let's start to think about how we teach differently. Mm -hmm. So if chat GPT maybe, or any AI, although now I think it's Microsoft invested a gazillion billion dollars. So it's basically there. But if chat GPT can do X amount of the work in teaching, then can you use teaching for something else? Can it be more of a discussion? Can it be more mm. of the conversation? Can it be more of an interactive? way versus you standing there and talking at people you know can you use it for more hands-on learning can you use that time you know differently so the same the same with brands like if we think of you know we've started to have a conversation with our creative team and we're going to do a round table uh an ai round table soon because like the reaction was like oh my god like they're going to write ads from now on because ryan reynolds had this mint mobile ad here in the us and it was written but by uh, uh, ChatGPT, and it was a whole joke, the whole thing. But it, you know, it was fairly did a fairly good job in explaining what the wireless company did. But you you're never going to have a substitute for creativity and creative thinking. Mm -hmm. So I want to say that first and foremost, the creative human mind is it, impossible to replicate. You can mm -hmm. replicate logic, you can replicate learning, and that's what AI does. It's going to learn faster than you can. But the creative mind is well, I may be wrong and maybe we're all going to be killed by a machine in 10 years. So <laughs> don't mark my words. Right now, today, I think the, it is impossible to replicate the creative mind and it is impossible to replicate human interaction. Mm. Mm. I, it I is think, impossible. I think the human interaction, I think the, the human creative mind, the replication of that, uh, I think will be a lot easier to to replicate than the human interaction that will take a lot longer uh to replicate and again this is uh this is something that i don't think we're ready for but it's here so it's it's a case of well what are you gonna do ignore it um and you know the, it it does throw up a lot of early ethical questions but then it also throws up philosophical questions well you know, if the outcome of uh, of of what you're doing here with ChatGP is this, but you're already using this, that, and the other for this, you know, where's the where's the moral dilemma? Like picking the bones out of what exactly are you doing at the moment before ChatGP mm. comes along? That you know is is not 100 you. Let's say as a as a, a personal brand, you have writers you know, writing articles on your behalf. You're putting them out there, but it's not you. And, you know, that's just a, a tiny, tiny, uh, that's just a tiny example of, of the moral question. And then it becomes, well, you know, how far does, does this really go? And the cre creativity side of things, man, like already some of the stuff that, that they're doing is crazy. And remember, ChatGPT3 is, you know, it, it is, is going to be, you know, kind of play center compared to ChatGPT4. And if we look at evolution in technology, you know, look at the first mobile phone and look at where we are now. Um, you know, I know that took 20 plus years to, you know, 30 years, but, uh, but you know, the, the, the evolution is inevitable. And, you know, I, I suppose really the, what you said in terms of the human engagement for me, that's that's an area that we all need to embrace because even if the creativity side of things and even if the robot side of things catches up to the point where it's level or even better than than humans it, it's going to create this void and this thirst for 
actual human engagement where we know yeah. that we're speaking with another human because we get used to well well where did that answer come from uh, am, am i talking to a human there or am i talking to a robot and i think we'll we'll go out in search of that human engagement because it's it's in our dna and we'll be drawn to that so i think there's uh, you know looking at chat gpt and not ignoring it and um, embracing it the way the universities are doing how can we use this to our benefit but then also looking at well what vacuum is this going to create that we can use to our advantage and i definitely think that human engagement is an area that's that's going to uh to just like supply and demand you know it's it's really going to be come something that we crave for and i think that's that's an area that brands can 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 really kind of make it work to our advantage would you would you agree with that uh, 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 in terms of that human engagement I do, and I'll and I'll tell you another um, example of what you're saying. For so long, I mean, I, I'm going to say maybe a decade, and I'm not sure why, but I, I feel like it started happening a decade ago. You would do focus groups for brand, you know, let's say you're doing campaign, whatever a campaign mm -hmm. or an innovation concept, and you're tight, and you always heard it's like, oh, that's kind of BS. Oh, that sounds like ad speak. Oh, that's you know, audiences want brands to be to be true. And they're, they see right through you. They see right through the, you know, right through the advertising. Yes. So if that is the desire of people, if people want brands to be real and transparent and honest and not the corporate, you know, self-serving kind of BS that sometimes people think brands do, then this is the opposite of that because this is only going to like create sort of these packaged responses or packaged ways of communicating or even packaged experiences. Yes, very intelligent for sure, of course, because it is AI and it'll learn from real human things and it'll learn to sound kind of quirky or human or or whatever. But it's if they see through brands today, I imagine they're going to see through it then as well, as you are saying. So I do think there is going to be even more of a desire to have some real human interaction and whatever that form may be. That may become, you know, like just real people creating content for brands that feel like there's a point of view from someone. Mm. Yeah, I, it's, it is a fascinating world. It's certainly scary. Um, the unknown is always scary for us, um, but, but really when you think about where where we could go and i think how fast it's moving is is really what's, yeah. what's so scary because you know we're not thinking anymore of you know what's the future gonna look like in in 20 years time or 30 years time it's what what's the future gonna look like in 18 months or two years yeah. because it's 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 moving that quickly and look i i, I think at the end of the day you know these things are upon us and if you are building a brand than putting your head in the sand or you know going out to your 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 garden to play with your dog it it, it doesn't cut it like you have to you have to stay on top of of what's going on you have to look at what the options are out there because evolution is inevitable it's 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 happening and you know if if you as a brand you're you're adopting these things or you're using these tools to to better the experience for your client then that's that's certainly what you should be doing and you know whether that's through ai whether that's through uh, a a web3 experience you know the the possibilities are endless but um it's it's definitely exciting times and it's i, I can understand why you live in that world because it is exciting of of thinking about the 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 future and living in that constant evolution and trying to always stay ahead of the curve and you know th this chat has been super enlightening I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will understand a lot more now about what web3 is and how that applies to their kind of smaller brands without them them being a coke and what they can kind of be thinking about for the future and how to apply it adrian i really thank you for taking the time to to join us today um it's been an absolute pleasure and uh i'm I'll, I'll be delighted to catch up with you in in another 12 months or so 18 months and and see how the world has changed in that time yeah well first of all thank you it was 
a pleasure for me as well. And I, I'm going to take you up on the 12 month converse, follow up conversation. And we should play back fit from today in 12 months and see how wrong I was. <laughs> Mostly. So Let's, I, I, uh, think, I think that would be fabulous. Yeah, we can we can bring our robots along to uh, to, yeah. to do the podcast for us. I'm going to send my avatar. <laughs> I'm going to be over this talking in real life. <laughs> as a, as i said thank you so much for taking the time to join to join us and um i'll be in i'll be in touch soon yeah thank you so much steven we really hope you enjoyed today's episode thanks so much for listening if you want to learn more brand strategy techniques to level up your skills make sure you check out brandmasteracademy.com there's plenty of free resources and premium content for you to download and get you going. If you'd like to join our Facebook group full of like-minded brand strategists all learning from each other, then find us by searching for the Brand Strategy Community where you can find exclusive content for members as well. If you enjoyed this content, please be sure to give us an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listened. And make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Brand Master Podcast.